studied here at IU uh, 20, 21 years ago. And, and that was a really an, a big turning point in my career because I was uh, I had a degree in, in chemistry before that. And IU is the only program that accepted me. I, I feel eternally grateful. And this is uh, me um, in front of Lindley Hall, where the old computer science department is. This is a tulip tree apartment where I lived. I just had such fond memory it was short 18 months master degree study. It's, it's of course, everything changed uh, so much. I, I was in the hotel. I was like, is this Bloomington or this is Paris. It, it just, uh, I had, it, the downtown is so modern. Uh, I had such a great time. I really, I, I really, you know, feel that I, I made the right decision to come in person to pay my tribute to my uh, alma mater. I have to thank all my professors, uh, uh, Professor Armour Sebri and Andrew Hansen are one of the two professors that I learned a, a lot from, you know, Beth Palali is it's the only female professor that I interacted with and, and, and she's just a, such a, a role model for me. Uh, learn database from Kirk, uh, algorithm from David Weiss, uh, operating system from Andrew, um, uh, uh, compiler, a little bit of compiler. It, it was it's so hard. <laughs> um, it, it, I, I also want to say that it, this IEO, um, even 20 years ago, was such an inclusive and diverse environment and it has such great support for international students, uh, uh, for me, like me. And, and, and I, I remember Andrew. Professor Hansen was struggling with the pronunciation of the student names at the orientation, including my name. And, and I just had such a great time um, and profound uh, gratitude towards um, IU Bloomington, the computer science department. Um, my daughter, she was born in Indiana too, uh, in uh, uh, Lafayette, when my husband was in uh, Purdue University. This is us. And, and so um, and it just, I had a lot of IU uh, Indiana connections. Um, <laughs> um, the, the data breach is something that I really feel very um, personal about because of my own personal experience and, uh, and I stopped keeping track of it for a long time. Um, but, but I'm just curious what really happened in all these uh, huge data breach incidents. Uh, um, I, what are the things that research researchers could do? Um, and, and so a lot of my research was uh, driven by this question, you know, what is academic research? You know, our, our profession has a lot of industry um, it, activities so which, which in, in so what is the academic research uh, mission and the niche and and this question i i learned it the hard way i had to so at the beginning of my academic career at, at uh, virginia tech and the virginia tech has a lot of government relationships in, including uh, defense contractors those are private companies who get dod fundings and and so um, because of the, the location close to Washington DC, one of the dad who, whose son goes to, went to Virginia Tech, um, I think he's from one of those big, you know, I, like, um, uh, um, Northam Grumman. And so, so he, he, he came to Virginia Tech, they want to find professors to entertain him. And then so, so I talked about my research and he was like, ah, this is just some sort of heuristics, right? Um, but we have, 1200 people with secret clearance. Um, and so that was really something that I, I it, it was very shocking. And I, I, and I think, you know, I certainly, I have no secret clearance. Um, what can I offer? And, and so, so I, you know, throughout the talk, I want to just, to, um, you know, discuss this, but, but in the end, I realized that universal research, my small group with six, seven PhD students, we can offer innovation deep insights, truthfulness, veracity, things that the people, people not necessarily say, but then it's, it's so true. And then we want to be unconventional. We want to say things that may be unpopular. And, and so, so these are the things that I think are, we are uniquely positioned that we are not here for profit. We are not affiliated with certain big brands. And one of the recent work that I did is a COVID contact tracing. Um, there has been work that showed that COVID contact tracing uh, based on this Google app and notification uh, exposure system is vulnerable. But we want to set the record straight that we, we, we did a deep dive to analyze 
analyze the, the notification framework. We want to show that for reasonable scenarios, that is completely safe, complete and thoroughly safe, completely fine to use it. Only in a very um, extreme scenario where you have organized the criminals who, who got your phone um, and then deploy multiple monitoring uh, points will be able to learn whether you got infected with COVID or not or maybe able to track your movement, but then based on their setting, that kind of tracking is pretty obvious anyway. And then there may be, um, so, so huge environment, a huge investment to learn a very little thing about you. And even for criminals in their right mind, they would very unlikely to do so. And so, so those are the things that I want to just um, do. And then today we want to talk about data breach, ransomware, and so it's just from an organization point of view. And, and my point is that organization culture is very important. And, and there are so many things that big executives could do. And but we want to just first understand what are the risks, what happened. And so I'm going to use uh, some examples. Um, one of the first examples is this uh, OPM, the Office of Personnel Management. I actually learned, learned this from my students. Uh, at Virginia Tech, a lot of students, they they get secret clearance from high school and they do internships with defense contractors. And so, so this OPM data breach happened in, in, in about 18 months. And it was only finally started at the end of 2013. Um, and it, this, is, this is an organization maintaining a lot of um, you know, uh, secret clearance uh, questionnaires um, in, in the including uh, secret agents, you know, a, a huge number. And, and at the, as a result of the breach, 21 million records of sensitive files were, was, was stolen. And even after the, the, a lot of publicity happened, the, 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 the organization eventually confirmed the, um, the, the breach. Um, and so, so one of the, what happened is, is um, this is, this is a, a very high level description of, of the investigation. Uh, in the in the spring of 2015, a company was uh, hired to look at the logs and could OPM suspect they're being hacked. Uh, the opmsecurity.org, and this is a, a traffic that people find in the log. And this obviously is not the official URL. It, in, in this came from a malware called PlugX. And it turns out that Lots of machines in OPM are infected with all kinds of little things adware, you know. So this, but then this plug X malware only infects about a dozen computers. Um, and those are the malware that make this outbound traffic. Um, and one of the, the machine is, is a data center gateway that's infected with the malware. And so from there, the, the investigator security analysts look at the logs, they look at who accessed this, um, the, 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 the data center, they find that there's some credential from this company called Keypoint, which is an OPM contractor. It's a private company. Keypoint uh, has an employee that connect to the data center during an Independence Day break. Um, and then the employee suddenly remember and police said, that's not me because I was vacationing, I was at the beach. Um, this must be uh, uh, the hacker. And so th from there, they, they, they confirmed that there's so many things that, that or was uh, uh, leaked. And a part of the analysis revealed that the OPM really didn't do much, you know, and there's uh, so many things that they could have done. Um, one of the, here are a few lists. One of them is the outbound proxy. And this is this is a sort of a, um, a, a filter, a filter at the perimeter of the network that it can do this monitoring, look at outbound traffic, look at well may, maybe there's a huge amount, amount of traffic that shouldn't be uh, shipped out. And so a lot of time that the, for government and, and organizations, this is really a man in the middle. Um, from a security textbook perspective, this is not a very safe design because when you have men in the middle, it can, they can inspect everything. But then from from uh, organization point of view, this is really very powerful way to monitor what's happening. Um, no, uh, the, no asset, there's no asset tracking, there's no reviewing of logs, and so there's a lot of things that they didn't do. Um, and, and so, so as, as you see that this is something that the people, um, 
looking back, our vision is 2020s. But but then you know you you learn something. You say, okay, maybe I should do that. I should I should review logs. I should do auditing. Uh, I should I should be able to know um, you know um, what kind of traffic. And so another example that is very recent. And this is uh, from the Russian attack on Ukraine. Um, um, from from the you know, I, I signed up myself for the uh, email list of this CISA, the Cyber uh, Infrastructure and Security Agency. So this is uh, under DHS. And so this uh, this recent alert called distracting malware. And a lot of time that you say ransomware is it's encrypt your file, but this one actually erase your files. And so, but it's display a fake ransom note. And even if you pay it, you will not get your files back. And as a matter of fact, there's some statistics, statistics um, uh, from 2017 that shows that half of the time, half of the time people pay ransom but still lost their data. Half of the time you pay and you recover, okay? Um, and, and the luckily 53% of the people who got surveyed say they never pay because they have backup or they don't care about that data. And, and so lots of times that, uh, you know, it's a, it's a smaller portion of people who paid. Um, if you can remember only one thing, please back up the data. And I keep saying this to my students, I tell them, if you graduate from Virginia Tech, you're going to be a chief information security officer, making sure you back up your data. And a lot of local governments, you know, the, the little small towns, town of Bloomington, you know, those kind of um, uh, people, they, they know that they have to back up. Um, and so one of the, the uh, that CISA, uh, this distracting malware came up, their, their notification, they say, this is a malware, um, what, what is this? what it did and it, it, there's a list of recommendations and so so nowadays the people are really getting more and more familiar with the things um, the preventive measures um, in the network segmentation if you look at this list everything makes so much sense and you wonder why would the people not doing this right the network segmentation multi-factor authentication recently white house uh, came up with a directive showing that people should have a zero trust um, in, in um, have as much, make it as much difficult as possible for people to renew their credential and to recover their credential and so on. Uh, hardening applications, so, you know, our department at IU has so many strong researchers, so Xiaojing and Lui, um, working on this area. Um, monitoring logs, and I've done some work monitoring um, uh, uh, behaviors and, and, and so on. And so, so many, so many moving pieces, but so many opportunities to stop attacks. And then this is in general is considered the defense in depth, and this is a strategy. It's not a single technology. It's a, it's a, it's a strategy. It's um, uh, a, a concept. It, it's concept uh, where you have multi layers of protection sometimes may be redundant um, and if resource allows that you should have um, the, the ones that you can afford to install and those kind of a defense in depth uh, concept is um, really important in the sense that we know we up to this point at the year 2022 we know a lot about individual technologies and, and then putting them together and then be able to have the mindset to to deploy them, it's it's really the key. It's really the key. And so I'm gonna use some examples. Um, and so by the way, and this is a, it, in this it mentions supplier ratings, and, and this is something you know in the recent supplier chain, supply chain attacks um, where you have you use third party software that got hacked, and this is uh, uh, very relevant. You know the, when you use those third party software, how secure they are. Do you have some ways to confirm that? And so, so, so I'm, I'm going to use some examples uh, um, to just illustrate a little bit more about the, the, the posture, the organization posture. You know, we, we are, as security researchers, we do things so meticulously. Um, and then you, you, would, you would think big companies, they are sitting on a trove of data, would probably do something similar. And so is that the case? And we're going to just discuss a little bit. And the security is, is of course, keep changing. And, and, and nowadays, it's in the ransomware, stay, nation stay back to hacking and so on. Um, and, and, but back, back in the 80s, and people say it was like a beach. Security is like a, a, a day on the beach because very few 
people are connected to the internet, you, you, you almost know who they are, something goes wrong, you give them a call. Um, but beach day, no more. Uh, the evil uh, attack last, uh, uh, in 2021, that happened during the Independence Day. Um, um, and, and, and nowadays you see a lot of warnings before holidays, Labor Day, you know, Thanksgiving, and in, in the, the federal agencies that you know, people, you, you, need, you need to have someone on call, and this is where the, the, the people would start hacking. Um, and so we all, for, for people who study cybersecurity, the first thing they learn is security is relative. As a matter of fact, this can be proved. Uh, Fred Cohen back in the 80s proved the security is impossible to achieve absolute security. Lots of times that I see, this is very, um, people, people don't believe it. Um, but then it's, imagine that you have a very smart virus that will be able to change its behavior depending on whether or not it's being detected. And so, so you can think of this virus, um, if it, the AV, the antivirus scan says this is a virus, then the virus does nothing, it behaves. Uh, then you, you reach a, a contradiction. Um, if the AV says this is not a virus, then the virus starts infecting everyone then you reach a contradiction again. And this is really the proof that, that you really cannot know for sure what's happening. Um, and this is very similar to the halting problem, unpredictable. Um, and, and in reality, that you see this play out in slow mo, slow motion, because a lot of the malware writers, they will do this type of testing. They use AV to scan their, their malware. If it trigger alert, then we'll tweak it and so that it never trigger a, a alert and you launch it. And so it's a keep updating, it's, it's constant arms race, cat and mouse games. Um, and so, 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 so we know that, we know that in, in lots of time that the, the media, the way that they portray is that the attack is so scary. It's, it's also so, um, um, powerful that there's no way that you can defend it. Um, I, I question that. I don't, I don't, I disagree with that. Uh, success, and, and so, so I want to explain a little bit that there are many uh, steps involved in a successful attack. Therefore, there are many, many opportunities to stop one. Um, so, so, you know, well, one of the examples that I want to show is that this uh, uh, recent hack, um, this is this is uh, this is from uh, last year. Uh, this is this is from last year or, or early this year. And so, so one of the issues involved is the dual uh, multi-factor authentication. It turns out to be uh, fail open. That means that if the authentication server is unreachable, dual will just uh, let the user go through. Will will not do any authentication. And so, unless you change the configuration, so by default, it's, it's fail open. But then fail open alone does not enable an attack. This particular attack, oh, this is just uh, this uh, last month, last month from, um, this is also Russian, this is Russian's hacking. Um, it involved multiple steps. Only the last uh, step involved is a fail open, but then initially it's you know, brute force password uh, attack. Um, and there's also, the, um, enroll a new device in an obsolete account. Um, and, and then it's for a print spoof for a vulnerability, the third step. The last one to gain administration privilege to, you know, to do privilege escalation. And then the last one is a fail open. Utilize this a fail open. So, so you know, if you look at this kind of attacks, it happens all the time. It's, it's multiple steps. Nothing is just the one thing, okay? Um, in, in, uh, in some of our uh, recent work, we look at the uh, memory randomization, ASLR security, part of the work we, we look to see, this is a graph that shows different type of uh, defenses, uh, control flow, integrity, if you have it, if you don't have it, uh, ASLR uh, randomization, and the different uh, defense condition will lead to different uh, attack surfaces. And so there's many different variations, but then they all, all of the advanced exploits follow on a very high level a, a few patterns that are very consistently. Um, and for example, they need a memory disclosure to de-randomize the, the, the page, de-randomize the, the address, the memory address. And then they need to have availability of gadgets and, and hopefully the ones that they can use. And then they need to have some system interface and so that it can make system calls. 
um, and, and then they also have a, a existence of vulnerabilities. Um, and so, so, so you look at this, it's, it's not that you can, you can have, uh, you made a one small mistake and then bam, you leaked uh, 100 million records. Um, and so a lot of time that uh, for, for all these th things to happen, stars have to align. Uh, that means the defense in depth would also make it harder for attacker to succeed, uh, to reduce the attack. One of the most um, um, shocking example is Equifax data, uh, data breach. And, and this one um, now to, I want to just go over a little bit of details. It happened in 2017. 2017, half of the US population's sensitive information, information was leaked. Um, and, and immediately after the disclosure of this, the, the company executives are like, oh, it was just oh, this one person who, who didn't patch. This one person, only if this person patched, none of this would have occurred. And so, you know, certainly it, it took 146 days. A lot of times people recommend 30 days to patch. And you see the exploits was generated, exploits what was generated the, the, the day right after the uh, vulnerability was announced. Um, the vulnerability um, it, itself is very much like um, um, a cross-site scripting buffer overflow in that flavor in, in the sense that untrusted external input gets executed accidentally. And in this case, it was uh, a malformed headers um, was rendered as code is supposed to, the, the design, the developers want to render it to, to provide feedback to the user, but then end up executing it, giving an attacker opportunity to execute arbitrary code. And so, so this is very classic, this type of uh, vulnerability is very classic. And so trust um, sanitized input and so on. Those are the number one biggest uh, software development practice. But, th but then Acrifex didn't patch. It not only did, did not patch, it has no idea what assets are on their network. Who, who runs the what uh, software? No idea. And they have an honor system for patching. They're like, ah, oh, I trust so and so. You know, they 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 will do a great job. Um, and developer didn't receive vulnerability. And then you would think that if it's a mama papa shop, this might be okay. Um, if like you know, if someone only use a computer to play games, so without money, this might be okay. But then for Equifax, a credit agency, and the biggest one, and if you, if you get mortgage and so on, you have to have Equifax uh, uh, credit. It, it, even though there are other agencies, but Equifax is the, is the biggest, is the most authoritative. Um, and so, so it's just unacceptable, unacceptable. Um, and it took a long time. It's, it's not like, I also want to emphasize it's not just Apache strut vulnerability. You have the vulnerability the next day, 140 million that record gone. It's not like that because it took a long time to exfiltrate 147 million records. And so uh, clearly there's no network monitoring, nothing being uh, observed, and none of this is being attacked. And so as a matter of fact, from mid-May to the end of July, this exfiltration uh, unauthorized access occurred. None of this was, was detected. You can also find that some websites uh, uh, under the Equifax domain has cross-site uh, scripting vulnerability. The initial freeze pin uh, is based on the timestamp, which is not secure, you know, can be guessed. Uh, the Argentina office that used the admin admin, the default username password. Um, and so clearly, you know, Equifax is, it's, it's pretty clear that they're not practice defense in depth and they seem to be really clueless um and you know in their defense and people may say oh security is relative anyway um but but then you know you, there's no effort you have to have a best effort uh, in security and even that you have some risk but then if you make zero effort and then because in, in this day people know a lot from technology wise how to defend the network you know, network, um, just from the network perspective, firewalls, intrusion uh, prevention, and, and then uh, software hardening, access control, and, and so many factors that you, so many tools you can use. Um, and part of this um, data breach uh, um, research leads me to look into how about regulations, you know, policies. And we are in the technology development space, but 
But then there's also government organizations and they can do something to require. Um, and so, so as a matter of fact, the payment card industry um, has a, a data security standard called the data security, data security standard, uh, DSS. And so I, I got notice of this uh, during uh, when I when I look at the target data breach, um, the, the 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 former CEO said that oh you know we got hacked but then we are in compliance we're, we are in compliance to this uh, data security standard so so we we did all you know what what, what we we could so I'm just curious so what is this um, and it turns out that the big banks uh, came together and they said that. You know, we, we need to make sure that every machine that process credit card should have certain security uh, quality. And, and, and this involved uh, a prior bank, EC or a bank of your card, and also the vendors, and the, which, which makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and so um, so we looked at the, the, the work was motivated by the target data breach. Um, and a very interesting thing about target data breach is the way that they treat, they, they actually did a lot of things. Um, and then one of the things is, is um, um, how they treated the security alerts. I want to just quickly uh, mention this a little bit before I talk uh, uh, a little bit more about the, the regulations. Um, so that, that occurred four years before Equifax data breach. At that time, it was the biggest. Uh, what happened is that the, the AC company, AC vendor for Zio Mechanical was hacked, you know, fell victim to a phishing attack. And then eventually the, 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 the malware gets installed on the point of sale device um, and then exfiltrated um, uh, the, the, all the credit cards um, that got slid on the, the uh, POS. Um, and so, so one of the one of the the question, of course, is how does the AC company get access to the internal target network? And and one of the theory is that, and so so this has never actually come to clear. Um, um, Equifax had a government report, but then the target data breach back then, 2013, there was no government report. But one of the theory, which I think is very believable, is that. The, they use this uh, SAP, this is a French-based company, they have an invoice payment system. And so this is where um, the, the vendors will submit their invoices and like PDF and so on, gets downloaded into target uh, internal network and, and, and some vulnerabilities that happen here that allow the attacker to, to gain privilege into the internal network. And so of course, this is, it's a missed opportunity in terms of learning, we, we never really know. But one of the things that opportunity that was lost is the, the fire eye alerts that was raised twice um, on the, the target uh, network but was treated as a false positives and then never treated very seriously and and this could really have been uh, something that um, was was uh, uh, responded to and then it would substantially expedite the, the de detection of the target data breach and then reduce the damage and the false alarms, and this has been a lot of my research, um, um, false alarms and false positive reduction, because it's never been, um, it's always counterproductive. And this is the island of Hawaii in uh, 2018 had a missile def uh, alert, and it turns out to be false al alarm. And a lot of people just uh, rushing out of the island only to find out this is uh, someone <laughs> put on the wrong switch. And, and so the interesting thing is that FireEye, this company, um, is so successful, they established their product. The, the main thing is that they don't have a lot of false alarms. And so knowing that, because they know that it takes a long time to conform an alarm and, and it's, it's, it's time consuming. And so they, they'd rather miss a certain kind of uh, issues that, uh, rather than having false alarms. And so, so it's knowing that context certainly would help the target security analyst, but, but, but then um, um, the FireEye is, is very different. Our University of Virginia Tech, they use FireEye. Everyone is really happy because before um, they were like, uh, they have to ask uh, people at the biology department to, to reinstall their operating system only to find out that is something benign. And, and now it's, uh, they don't have a lot of issues with that. Um, you know, my, my own research, we look at the anomaly detection and then so on, and then we look at the, the domain knowledge. And the, one of the, the findings, the high level findings is that um, you have to build models to capture diverse behaviors. Otherwise, and, uh, 
you, you otherwise you will not be able to have um, 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 high precision. And so, so you know, the understanding the domain, um, you know, we have multiple multi-layer detection, and this is the work that we look at system call function call traces and, and capture their behaviors um, to to reduce. Um, the, the false positives. And a lot of time they take a long time to, to optimize this kind of thing. Um, when I, when I uh, wrote my book, Anomaly Detection, I realized that it's, it's a lot of the work is very hard to deploy because it takes a long time to, to, to optimize, to, to fine tune. And so my ongoing work is to make it um, more deployable um, so that um, you can commercialize better. Um, you don't have to sell a product and then, and then deploy two PhDs to embed two PhD there for two years for, for the product to run. And so how to, how to make this kind of uh, high precision detection um, more automatic. And we also apply um, this work into the, the code scanning domain. And one of the focus, and this is a crypto guard work is for detecting code misuses, crypto API misuses. Um, and, and we have a really high precision. The work is also being used by Oracle Labs. Um, and, and so one of the, the, the feature is do not have, we don't have a lot of false positives. Um, so going back to the, the regulation, how well are the, the, the data standards regulations? Let me just do it. Okay, sorry, okay. Um, how well are the, the data security standard regulations? Um, in terms of their, you know, how, in terms of their enforcement, okay, um, and how, how can you how can you um, measure it? And so we looked at this PCI the payment card industry. Um, they have the, it's beautifully written regulation, beautifully written, um, and it's also say if you have big vendor, if you have Walmart, okay, the annual transaction six million plus, you have to do automatic scanning, quarterly scanning, you have to have auditor come to your organization, you have to answer questionnaires, uh, you have smaller mama papa shop, um, you, you have to do the quarterly vendor uh, scanning, and this is a scanning of um, a, a sort of black box scanning of your, your systems that process credit cards. And so, so big or small vendors, they have to go through this uh, Quarterly scanning, and so so I want to wonder. I want to I want to see who are the the vendors. Who, I, I think I, I know this is very difficult to find out whether you have cross site scripting vulnerability, cross site request surgery, uh, forgery. Um, so even from a research point of view, I I, don't, I think it's difficult. But then people are sell, selling this as a product. How well are they? And and uh, and I look at some of the vendors in scripting. I was like, this is very rudimentary. Um, the open ports, TCP, UDP, this is not security. This is just a you know, basic network scan. And so we want to set up a, a test bed to, to just to find out what are the security guarantees. Um, and this is what we did. We have uh, what we call buggy card test beds, look at uh, e-commerce website. And then we have the, um, uh, we have find, uh, identified a few scanners, commercial scanners, some are high end in, um, one to thousand per year, some are low end or one to hundred uh, or, or even less than that per year uh, scanners. And so, so we have, we embedded 35 vulnerabilities in, in, in different categories. You know, we have some cross-site scripting, we have you know, default passwords and, and, and so on. Um, and if the scanner tells us, oh, you have vulnerability, you have to fix that, we will fix it. We fix a minimum number of vulnerabilities until we get 35. Until we, they say, you're good, we give you a certificate, you're, you're, you're in compliance. And so we want to see, do we still have open vulnerabilities in, in, the, in the, uh, the, uh, our website, this fake e-commerce website? Um, we, we didn't expect them to uh, de detect the secure storage because we, uh, in the test beds, we also store um, the CVV numbers and we are not supposed to, uh, and no, none of the e-commerce e websites are supposed to store that. So, so only 29 scannable from externally. Um, a quick summary, five out of the six scanners, 35 vulnerable websites. And so, so that, that's, that, they, they know their vulnerability, but they certify it. Um, as a result, we also look at the, 
existing e-commerce website or, or, or a thousand of them, we want to see are they uh, uh, compliant to the PCI uh, data security standards. And the majority of them have some issues. And those are the, the required things that they should fix, but they, they don't. And so we wrote a small program that detects this. Um, just a, a, a quick summary. Here we list the five scanners, but there's actually six. And um, there's one scanner that was packaged under two different names. <laughs> so so they, they, they sell the same thing under two different names. And, and so it's actually just the five scanners. Uh, the first row, the first row is uh, the, the total number of vulnerabilities detected out of 29. Okay, so they're, they're good ones. It detects 21 of the, the, the scanner, uh, the vulnerabilities. Um, the second row is the, the number of vulnerabilities remaining in the 35 version. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the last one is the, the vulnerability detected but did not ask to fix. And this is, it's, this is very interesting. There, there, uh, in, I, a lot of time that, uh, for, for me, I think that the, the scanner, the scanner would, uh, would, would just pretend that it's okay, even though that they, you know, they certify, and this is, you know, if Jin here, she can comment on this economic aspect of cybersecurity is really misaligned. Um, in order, you don't want to be sort of, from a business point of view, you don't want to be a really strict scanner. If you're so strict, nobody passed your test. You know, then people are going to lose your, lose your business and people will go find other scanners and they will just scan a mediocre website. And I think there's, there's a part of it um, um, involved in this. Um, and so, so the, the so, so, so we also disclose this to the PCI Security Council, and then they are, and to my surprise, that they are, they seem to be fully, uh, um, they're, they're not surprised. They're, they're like, okay, uh, you know, this, this, this is always, uh, we always uh, struggle with this. Um, and they, they seem to suggest that because this scanning is so difficult, um, they have to pass the some scanners. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> otherwise the whole industry collapses, and so so they have to like, and then and then the way that they, they say that they set up two two test beds, and and uh, um and then you can retake the exam, um and after a while that the scanner will figure out so uh, where is the the, the problem that the URL you, you take the exam long enough it's like multiple choice question <laughs> that you can guess all the choices, and so lots of time that um that it is it's really after talking with them I I noticed that it's. The, the, there is so much security work, research work that needs to be done to help the industry, um, to guide them to, to design better scanners. And, and it's really, um, it's, it's very necessary, but, but it's something that I, I think um, uh, our area, the research area, the researchers, we, you know, lots, I, was, I was very shocked because I was under the impression cross-site requests of forgery, um, was, it was, first reported, you know, like that more than a decade ago, um, the industry would naturally step up and then figure out how to detect it. Not really. A lot of time that even um, in the JavaScript is very, uh, this dynamic language is very hard to analyze. Um, so very quickly, Target did a lot of things uh, right after data breach, um, um, including multi-factor authentication and, and the multi-factor authentication was actually became a requirement in the uh, data security standards in PCI. So, so things are improving. Things are definitely improving. Um, I want to use, just to use a few minutes to quickly go over some of the, my research on uh, detecting data leak um, at the service. And, and our threat model is accidental data leak. This is where you have employees who accidentally uh, forgot to uh, encrypt uh, sensitive data and send it to the outside perimeters and so on. Um, and, and one of the, the criteria that we want to um, set up is, is it possible you ask a cloud provider to do the data leak detection, but then without telling them what your sensitive data is. Um, and, and so, but still enable provider to be able to do the, the, the detection. And, and a lot of the detection is very similar to an antivirus scan. And you, you, get, you give me the, your social security number, I'll look for that pattern in the outbound traffic. Um, and then you have to do some pre-processing, but then I don't want to give them my social security number. 
And so what we happen, what we designed is called a fuzzy fingerprint. We, we give them something that close to our real sensitive data, just to perturb it in a way that they cannot uh, guess what it is, even if there's a uh, match, even if they uh, will, will find the pattern in the outbound traffic. And so, so this is um, something that will, would enable the comparison and uh, but still be able to hide, the, uh, provide a certain degree of privacy. We also uh, follow up the work by make it um, uh, to support transform the data leak, the, the data that has partial match, um, and also have the high performance aspect with Hadoop, MapUU, uh, Map, MapReduce, and the GPU. Um, and so, so this is this is this is the work that uh, that I personally feel very excited about. Um, in the enterprise data breach, and then the, but recently there's this new beast that I want to quickly discuss a little bit before we end. Um, and, and this is this is very different from from everything that we just described. Um, the, the, I tend to I, I, know I tend to be an optimistic person and say you know you can reduce your risk if you work hard enough you know have a right organization culture things are uh, under control. But Pegasus is a malware targeting a lot of individuals. Um, it's it's a cyber weapon. It's weapon grade. It's military grade spyware targeting individuals. And so you don't have the a, a CISO backing you up. You just have yourself. And a lot of the, them are activists, uh, journalists, uh, um, and they just fell victim to the the Pegasus uh, malware. And so it's it's all came to light. It has been around for for a long time. And the, the Israel based company NSO has been selling this um, since. Uh, yeah, at least uh, 20, 2016 to government. And then um, last year, 50,000 phone numbers uh, were leaked on a list and this is uh, supposed to be a Pegasus hit, hit list. There's lots of Mexican uh, individuals in the Morocco, UAE. Among them one are, are journalists from, um, uh, uh, from, from uh, more sort of liberal leaning uh, press and, and a freelance reporter in Mexico was ambushed at a car wash, um, and and because his phone and his his phone number is on the list, but his phone cannot be recovered, so so it's never confirmed that he is one of but his number is on the on the hit list. Um, and of course, you know, the government all denied. Oh, we have nothing to do with this. And so so it's extremely um, scary, and. And 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 then um, that that this kind of, and, and a lot of times that the people's phone got to, hacked without them knowing and then being recording their videos and audio and uploaded and use them to, to uh, blackmail them. Um, it was sold as a terrorist fighting tool uh, to government. And so 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 I want I want to just quickly explain a little bit that how scary it is. It came. It became. It. it uh, from the typical phishing, phishing, uh, one-click phishing to zero-click, you get a text message. Your 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 phone is infected. One of the uh, the the issue is the GIF. GIF is those kind of animated thing. Uh, people find that uh, infected uh, phones so will have lots of GIF files during the the hack. Um, what happens is that the GIF. Um, the iPhone has a sandbox system called Glassdoor. It was much, very much celebrated, the Glassdoor. Um, but, but, but then the GIF uh, has to loop. And, and the iPhone, the, the looping, the, the required rendering happens outside the sandbox. Um, and then the, the hackers does not send a real GIF. It send a PDF that has a lot of junk data that trigger an integer overflow problem. Um, and, and then, the the the, oh, the PDF compression tool has a vulnerability um, of the the integer overflow, and, and the part of the issue is that the iPhone um, process the file based on the real extension. It, even though iPhone expect a GIF, but then see a PDF, say, oh, I got a PDF. I have no choice but process this as a PDF, and then this is a, a rogue PDF. And so all these factors have to align. Um, and for this to happen, and a lot of the, the earlier uh, versions of iPhone um, uh, is vulnerable. 
And so, so it's really scary because you are an individual and you're dealing with a military grade of spyware. iPhone recently decided to sue NSO, this, this company, because the, the, the iPhone customers are impact, impact. They also um, announced some investment in research in the, uh, the, the cyber surveillance research, which is really um, a great. Um, and, and, and then you look at this kind of cyber attacks and um, people say that colonial pipeline hack, uh, because it's a um, nation state backed hacking, and, and you have private company dealing with this nation state backed hacking, lots of time that um, it's, it's this huge asymmetry happening. Um, and, and, and the good news of, of with this is that the, the colonial pipeline hack, half of the, the ransom was recovered because the, the a lot of the U.S., a lot of the Bitcoins uh, uh, infrastructure that process Bitcoins is owned by United States infrastructure. And so they're, they're, uh, the government kick in uh, fast enough to stop the Bitcoin from being retrieved by uh, the, uh, the hackers outside the country. And, and but then you see there's just their policy, their technology is just complicated um, in a very extreme case. But, but as a, a wrapping up, um, what are the take home messages besides you have to back up your data? What should the executive do? And I keep telling my students, you're going to be executives down the road when you, you know, in reach age, reach mid age, and then you have to really think. Um, I, I was very shocked during the uh, Cambridge Analytical scandal. I, I was not purely shocked by the scandal, but I was shocked by this lawmaker during a congressional hearing. And he said that, oh, Mark, you, the choice is in your hands. You can, you can go back to California, you will hire the most expensive lobbyists and then descend them on Capitol Hill and then convince, convince the Senate and Congress to pass the, the loosest, loosest possible privacy laws and data protection laws that benefit your company. Or you can do the right thing. You can, you can stop you know, sharing the, the user data. You can, you can do the right thing. And, and I was like, you are a lawmaker, you are making laws, you are asking a, a, a private company to, to do this. You, you're, you know, I, I live in this country long enough to know check and balance. And so, so it's really, but, but of course, if you look at the comparison to European countries in these countries, historically, it's very loose on regulations, the cyber regulation. Um, you just, you cannot co completely rely on, uh, on uh, private companies, but private company leaders, uh, you know, among all pressures, they do have to do the right thing, and they have to invest in cybersecurity. The cyber, the Equifax, uh, three O's, three O's to step down, CEO, CIO, and CSO all step down, and and you know, a lot of the cybersecurity exec managers never attend any of the, the, the cybersecurity meetings. Um, and, and so, so, so they, they, you know, the government, the organization culture really makes a difference. If the, if the CEO jokes about cybersecurity, then people quickly get a hint um, and then you have to stop, you will suffer. And so, so, so part of the, the education, um, the, the workforce, the training, workforce development is not only tell security analysts, Future security and but also tell the CEOs and, and the future CEOs and CISOs. But what what can researchers uh, do? And and, and I'm, I, I more and more believe that you know as our field mature, really the trans, translational research the research that would um, can be deployable in the real world that leads to to that is is, is a must. And a part of this is what I realized that a lot of the times that. If you do this kind of translational work and you, you make a real world impact, a lot of times that you get dinged and people say, oh, this is not no novel. You, you know, this, this is useful work, not novel. But a lot of times that in the name of novelty, people end up doing things that um, have, they end up rejecting a lot of useful work that could have helped the, 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 the practitioners a, a lot. And so, so I myself, in my own uh, leadership roles, I, foster a lot of conferences and, and, and so on to, to encourage this kind of a work, including the SECDEV, the Security Development Conference. Um, and then we have a call opening for papers and tutorials and, and the practitioners uh, submissions. Um, and in the part of it, in, in, 
is because I myself experienced so much obstacles. Um, and I think that we really have to do better. And uh, we, we need to accept just different type of research. Um, and just very quickly, uh, um, I'm, I'm organizing this uh, I mentor workshop is a diversity workshop. And last year we have uh, uh, Lydia Perlman giving a keynote. This year we're excited that we really hope to be able to meet in Los Angeles uh, in person together with CCS. Um, and so, so very much look forward um, um, to, to organize this. And, and, um, and so I, I plan to talk about how to do rebuttal this year. Last year, we, we talked about time management. And I also talk about the imposter syndrome and, and so all these kind of good things. And so that, that's all uh, I want to say. And thank you so much for your questions.